Welcome everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our panelists for being here. Um, Reagan McDonald leads uh, Mozilla's policy work in the EU covering a range of issues, including privacy, data protection, content regulation and disinformation. Prior to joining Mozilla, Reagan worked at Access Now and before that at the European Digital Rights um, Institute. Uh, we're also joined by Annabelle. Annabelle works for, um, she leads Amazon Web Services policy work on data in Asia Pacific. And welcome Annabelle, we're really looking forward to hearing your views today. Um, Sean, who isn't here yet, is a CIGI senior fellow. He's the co-founder of Digital Public, which builds legal trust to protect and govern digital assets, and is the CEO of Frontline SMS, um, a global technology social enterprise. He's also a fellow at the Duke Center on Law and Technology, a visiting fellow at Stanford's Digital Civil Society Lab, and is an advisor to IEEE's Ethics and AI Committee. Welcome all. Before I get to asking questions, I wanted to set the stage for today's discussion. Um, as the driver of growth in the digital economy, it is fairly obvious that data is of strategic value in the digital economy. Incidents like Cambridge Analytica have exposed how tech firms are collecting and exploiting data to influence our behavior and reveal the power of that data over our lives and democracy. Increasing awareness of growing dependence on data and its value for society has generated interest from policymakers seeking to control the market for data and set rules for how data is gathered and used. We have two large data blocks which are emerging. Uh, the first being led, of course, by US, which has prioritized a free market approach to data governance. Um, the second being the Chinese model of data governance that is more state oriented in terms of control over data. And now we also have a third uh, block which is emerging led by the EU, the European Union, that is championing a rights-based approach to data governance. From research and talk and from speaking to policymakers and um, other researchers working in this area, our understanding is that at the heart of regulatory efforts for data governance, there are two key objectives. The first is enabling access to data held by private platforms, as without access to data, to vital data, neither the public nor the private sector will be able to exploit the benefits of data. The second objective that policymakers seem to be pursuing is to tackle market challenges presented by, mono by data monopolies, platforms that are effective due to their network, network effects actually uh, become data monopolies as they consolidate their control over data. Regulatory response is required, but and while some are pursuing antitrust action in this area, um, breaking up big tech also uh, reduces the network effects which make them um, important in the first place. So much of the debate on data governance in India and beyond has focused on protecting personal data so far. We've had the general data protection regulation in the EU, um, which has, that has carried forward the legacy of the data protection directive and introduced a new sanctions regime, which as Professor Thomas Trines has noted, seems inspired by the EU competition law. India too has been focusing on regulating personal data at least since 2017 after the Supreme Court of India. India's decision in K. Puttaswamy versus Union of India that held the right to privacy to be a fundamental right. A government appointed committee has worked on a draft personal data protection bill, which is yet to become law. While the personal data of customers and citizens is protected by privacy laws across the world, non-personal data remains largely unregulated. Non-personal data includes anonymized data like climate trends collected by weather app or um, data collected by machines um, or also commuter patterns gathered by cab aggregators. In India, a committee of experts constituted by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology um, uh, to come up with a framework for non-personal data governance has released its report and is accepting comments till the end of this month. So our objective in this panel is not to really analyze, welcome Sean, sorry, I was um, distracted by my screen, uh, welcome. Uh, so. Again, this panel is not going to get into the nitty gritties of the non-personal data framework. Um, it's a long way from becoming law. Um, rather, what we want to do is we want to explore some of these concepts that seem to be um, informing policymakers' moves around data governance and the strategies around data governance. At the heart of the report, for example, the committee's report on non-personal data is this um, 
um, idea that um, data is an economic resource that can be owned and accessed and the question of who has ownership and control over value generated through the production of non-personal data. So um, I'm going to start with Reagan. Um, we've, Reagan, we've seen that uh, data is reordering markets and its economic and social importance have led to data being compared to other natural resources like oil. Um, and you know, we see the, the focus on trying to um, regulate data as a valuable resource. Um, We've also seen that in the EU, a slew of new legislation we have, apart from the GDPR, we have the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act. So I was wondering, and the Digital Governance Act. So I was wondering if you could um, talk us through where the EU seems to be coming from and where it is headed in terms of regulating both personal and non-personal data. Sure, thanks. Hi, uh, good evening and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so indeed, the EU has been making a lot of headway in thinking about, like many other governments, including India, thinking about what the future of data governance um, should look like. Um, and there have been uh, some really interesting regulatory uh, proposals that go in that direction. So first, it's, it's really vital to acknowledge that data can play a key role in industrial policy and also serve as the basis for insights and innovations that can advance the public interest. Um, we've seen this thinking evident in the Data Governance Act, which the EU proposed um, just at the end of last year. Um, and they're really trying to wield this nature as a tool to advance the public interest and also to regulate monopolies. Um, but achieving that, I think there's a lot of good ideas that we're seeing, but really being able to achieve it and make it practical and avoid the risks um, I think there's quite a bit of details uh, that need to be worked out uh, in this process. So um, first on the on the sort of public interest uh, piece, we do have the GDPR, um, as you've mentioned, um, but that those rights, the GDPR and other sort of data protection frameworks, at least in the EU, are still really centered around individual protection. And it hasn't quite gotten to that point of thinking about um, collective um, collective representation, collective protection, and mitigation of collective harms. Uh, and Jody, you had already mentioned Cambridge Analytica. That was also my example, because that's really where we're seeing a lot of these harms, like data-related harms that uh, live, is not necessarily in terms of the individual. Um, and in this case in particular, you didn't have to have your data uh, taken or given to Cambridge Analytica to, be, to have experienced the harm. So I think there's a lot more thinking now about how can we think about data protection and build on the individual data uh, protection rights to think about the, the collective and um, both in terms of management and also protection. So that's sort of one piece. Um, at this moment, we're, you know, those, those collective rights aren't quite where the GDPR has landed, but we hope that this will be part of the, the discussion in the EU. Um, on the industrial policy side, the EU is really, as I mentioned, looking to improve competition and open up markets with, with different data approaches. And many governments are really becoming much more savvy about the role of data. Um, and we're seeing this evident in not only, for instance, the Data Governance Act, but also in a lot of antitrust trends. Um, and there's a lot more awareness about how uh, data and market power are very much intertwined. And so opening one can lead to competition uh, or more open and markets in another area. Um, we've at the same time been very uh, cautious, like encouraging a lot of these ideas, but trying to be cautious not to duplicate uh, existing problems into new frameworks. So for instance, uh, for the EU, uh, which, is, which is seeking to think about these sort of data intermediaries um, as a way of replacing these, these data monopolies or private companies, um, we don't want to just replace US data guzzlers with EU ones, right? So we also need to think about what, what you know, this is I think also an opportunity that we can think about what are different ways that we can think about data governance. And we, like Mozilla has been long time um, uh, champions of, of lean data practices. So maybe there's new ways to think about how we perceive of data particularly in the context of innovation. Um, and then there's also the other sort of broader risks that we have we have been very public about around um, the possible centralization of power, around increased privacy and security risks, 
um, and just generally, I think around uh, data stewardship models is in, in that there is some lacking, um, some practical examples of how these stewardship models, whether trusts or otherwise, can really work in practice. So like I said, I think there's a lot of promising ideas. We're moving into a, a really a good direction, but there's quite a bit to be worked out in terms of the details. And so we have been advising governments that they should be consulting often and openly um, with experts. Um, from everything from civil liberties to security um, to businesses um, to better understand how to um, forge a sort of future way of thinking um, without recreating the same uh, systemic problems that we have now. Thanks, Reagan. I have so many questions for you, but I want to get um, my panelists to get a word. Um, Sean, as somebody who has been critical of the Data Governance Act um, as recently as 20 days back, and as somebody who's been working on the idea of uh, data trusts and community rights for quite a few years now, um, what is your reading of EU strategy, India's strategy, um, the whole idea of trying to establish a framework uh, of community rights over whether personal or non-personal data, where do you see it headed? Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for, for inviting me to this. Uh, I think the old adage is like any panel in which there are two McDonald's is, is at least bound for economic prosperity. So um, good, good news on that front. But uh, no, it's, 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 I have been so fascinated by the way that, that data trusts and sort of rights associated um, have been interpreted in these legislative frameworks. I just want to set out a, like two or three of my really quick biases, and I just just to be clear, so we, so you can, can so the rest of it makes sense. Um, the personal non personal data distinction I think is an extremely precarious one in today's comp computing environment and in today's data availability environment. And so when we talk about personal versus non-personal data, the distinction to me is a really blurry one. And I think that there's been such great commentary throughout the series about the definitional ambiguities and the concerns there. Um, but I just wanna say like, if what we're trying to achieve are these sort of social and economic outcomes that we're describing, then I think we have to grapple seriously with some of those definitional issues. Um, and I think, you know, the, the second piece of this is that, um, there's a lot of empathy because there's a need to create a sort of professional management infrastructure for data as a sort of cross-cutting industry. And at the same time, um, a lot of what we talk about as like ownership of data or a lot of, frankly, a lot of what we talk about when we talk about data full stop is not really data the object. It's rights that emanate through or are associated with that data. So my right to be represented in a particular way or my right to access a particular service. Those rights are what convey my, my what's in law, it's called standing usually. And so that's what gives me the right to, to bring a claim against something or, or to participate in the decision-making around how data gets governed and used. And so it's, I, I only start with those assumptions to say that you know, a lot of what both the NPD and the Data Governance Act are trying to do is, is come from an existing framework, which everybody know has some familiar holes and build this, you know, kind of professional edifice or professional set of standards of treatment. The challenge in my experience has been that exercising agency is, is the bigger problem than almost any of the individual issues that we talk about. And so, you know, if, um, if, you're, if you're a person who's, who feels wronged or misrepresented, the things that you can do are kind of help correct the commercial ecosystem, but you, it's very difficult to try and compel change in the commercial ecosystem or to, to seek resolution. So you see kind of data trusts becoming about stewarding data and not stewarding rights. And I think that that's the big cleavage that we start to see in between what, what trusts are historically, which is the management of a very specific, and I say trust, trust, but you know, stewards, representatives, attorneys, doctors, insurance brokers, people who go forward theoretically under, you know, as a service to you to represent your interests in a complex ecosystem, no matter what that, you know, what that profession is, 
it's your ability to, to manage your relationship with that service provider and, and the standards, not only of care, which it, it's lovely to see the standard of care articulated in the NPD. I think what's missing conspicuously is the duty of loyalty, right? And so that how it is that you enforce that these folks are actually um, governing in your best interests, it becomes the issue for governance, right? That, that's, that's what builds the trust. That's what builds the fidelity of the ecosystem. That's what creates effective rights brokerage. And without that loyalty, without articulating not only whose interests you're representing and what interests you're representing in that ecosystem, and then and that, that's how you derive a standard of care in, in most settings. And so what we have at the left, you know, at this point is sort of the tabletop without the legs. And, and I think that that's the main, you know, for, in, in trying to prop up a lot, you know, in trying to help support these commercial ecosystems while recognizing that, the, that, that realizing the rights attendant to these ecosystems is a gigantic undertaking. These policy, you know, they build on really good ideas and I think they're, they're a clear form and to really belabor this analogy set the table but um, there are really, really important missing legs. And so it'll be interesting to see how it is that as those proposals move toward legislation, they start to fill in some of those gaps. Thanks, Sean. We are going to circle back on many of the issues that you raised, uh, particularly this binary, you know, split between personal and non-personal data. But um, Annabelle, um, you are based in Asia Pacific, uh, which has been the hub of some really interesting strategies around data um, in recent years and working for um, as a representative of a transnational company that has to navigate these various strategies. How do you see uh, what has been the impact um, of such strategies on the company's um, approach to data and how they you know, are modifying their practices or the behavior to cope with these multiple strategies and framings of data governance. Thanks so much, Arti, and um, uh, good evening, everybody, as well. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so just a bit of context, I think it's helpful for, for me to also state my own personal biases. Um, so I'm with um, Amazon Web Services. Um, so we're the cloud computing arm um, of Amazon. Uh, and that means that I think for the most part, we don't really uh, manage personal data. Um, you know, a lot of our customers are companies who maybe um, deal with personal data, but often we don't have any control or visibility over that data that's our customer's data. So just, just kind of setting the stage there very quickly. But before my time in AWS, um, I was actually with the Singapore Data Protection Authority and um, DPAs out in Asia are very interesting. Um, so we were part of the same organization that was also the industry engagement, industry development arm um, of the Singapore government for the Infocom industry. Um, and so in my time, I, I, my portfolio had me covering dealing with kind of very day-to-day -day issues around, you know, having written a law and having companies asking you many, many questions around how to comply with the law. And of course, you know, there were also cross-border data flow um, restrictions in some shape or form in the Singapore law. So, you know, even though it was fairly permissive, there was still a lot of confusion from companies. Um, and on the flip side of that, um, we had that kind of data innovation, um, you know, mandate as well, you know, trying to help Singapore companies um, who were interested in innovating the data, um, innovate in a safe manner. And so I very much come from the mindset that um, the idea that privacy and innovation are mutually exclusive um, isn't necessarily the case. That's not to say, though, that... Um, uh, just because they're not mutually exclusive doesn't mean, therefore, that you know you can go out and do whatever you want, and there wouldn't be any ramifications. And I think um, ultimately, when we think about how, first of all, how if you're a company and you're operating in multiple jurisdictions and you're thinking about data governance of, as a whole, um, what is really, really important at the end of the day, um, from my perspective, both wearing a privacy hat, but also kind of ensuring that the value of data that you're, you're creating is, is, you know, is being managed and maintained properly, um, is making sure that data is ultimately safe. What, what do we mean by safe? Um, I think at the end of the day, you could have all the best intentions in the world. We often focus on the Cambridge Analytica because it captures the imagination and you know, it's, it, you, you do sometimes have genuinely bad actors, but most companies, um, they, they don't necessarily set out to do bad things with data that they've collected, usually for a very functional, boring purpose. 
Um, what often happens though is they don't think about how they're governing data well. Um, that results in you know, a data breach. And if that data breach is not controllable and it, it really just goes out into the open world, um, there's nothing you can do about those data sets. So when I was you know, wearing my hat as, as part of the Data Protection Authority, a lot of my focus was there for talking to not only companies that you know, we kind of were responsible for in my country, but also other regulators, privacy regulators in particular, about the importance of um, focusing on security controls. And privacy regulators do not like to think about security controls. Um, it's a principle in the law, but it's very technical. And so usually they're like, you know, we'll leave it to a security expert to think about it, but you have to have a reasonable standard of security put in place. Um, the, the challenge with um, what I'm seeing, candidly speaking, with a uh, fragmentation, I know the question you kind of posed to me is when you're in Asia, you're looking at it, you know, you see maybe three big blocks of, I don't know if you call it data blocks, but, um, you know, kind of data regulation framework blocks. I, I think there were more and increasingly we're seeing fragmentation. So with greater fragmentation, that means that companies um, who operate in multiple jurisdictions need to think about how to create a global kind of, we can call it baseline framework, and then, you know, um, build on top of that. Um, that's maybe more feasible for a company that's well resourced, but becomes incredibly difficult for, for, for smaller companies um, who, who may not have those resources. Um, a lot of the time startups, for example, are you know, dealing with lots, of lot, lots and lots of potentially sensitive data, but they may not have you know, the resources to build a full data governance team and go and have deep thoughts about how are they going to meet those standards. So they're going to do what they feel, I guess, is a reasonable, you know, best effort approach and, and, and focus on that. And so I think at the end of the day, um, the challenge with having many different laws and trying to figure out how to comply with different laws and trying to figure out all the different principles that um, are entailed in these different laws um, ultimately means that companies might take risks. And um, again, you know, wearing that data protection authority hat, that's the worst thing that could happen. You know, you create a framework that, you know, in theory sounds great on paper, um, but when you implement it in practice, um, you know, people can't implement it and then don't implement it and, you know, don't focus on, on a lot of things. So at the end of the day, I mean, this is a very roundabout way of me saying, um, I think data security is really important. Um, as a cloud service provider, we often worry that um, people, in, in order to comply with a set of requirements that seem really complicated, people pick what in their view is the safer option, which is maybe like keeping data in, a, you know, in, a, in an on-premise storage kind of data center that they built themselves, you know, at the, under their desk in a little server. Um, and that sometimes means that they aren't being able to maintain the, the, the level of security that they should be on that server, but still be carrying a lot of really important data. And, um, and that increases the, the risk of um, data breaches as well. And, you know, and then that cycle perpetuates. Um, and very briefly then I wanna to touch about what I feel as I listen to, you know, lots of really wonderful panels that have been put together today on, on non-personal data. I think it's well and good to talk about the rights. I think it's a very noble thing that the Indian government is trying to do, trying to figure out how do you, um, you know, there, there, are, there is data that exists. How can we access in some shape or form that data and do good things with it? I think that's a very noble aim and a very noble outcome. But I think the thing that we're not talking about is how scary, and I think Sean touched on that briefly, but how scary it is if the governance frameworks aren't in place when whoever it is, for whatever reason, using whatever mechanism is able to obtain that data. And I, I like to kind of end my opening remarks really on this note. I think it's incredibly inspiring that the, the, the word that um, the Indian government thought of, uh, really, you know, I guess even people thought of when um, they decided, instead of calling it data controllers in the, the personal data protection bill, they called it a data fiduciary. And when you think about fiduciary, you think about fiduciary duty. I think Sean mentioned the duty of loyalty and it's also the duty of care. Um, the idea that you have that fiduciary duty in the personal data protection space, but somehow you don't have maybe that fiduciary duty lined out in the non-personal data space is deeply confusing. And I think we will spend more time talking about how that line is very artificial and you know, ultimately you could be using non-personal data to affect an individual and that could have really bad outcomes, even though it was maybe weather data about you know, the individual in the area that he lives in, 
combine that with enough information about an individual that might be anonymized, and you can have some pretty granular profiles. So when you really think about all of that, it shouldn't matter whether that data is personal or non-personal. What should matter is whoever's creating that data and then whoever's using that data, and that could be the same or different um, people or entities, need to still continue that kind of fiduciary duty of care, making sure that you know they're hitting the right level of protection on the one hand, but also making right and accountable decisions. And that's obviously going to be challenging, you know, um, but but I think that's something that should be the focus as more and more people start thinking about using data. So I'll, I'll just stop there right now. Thank you. Um, it is quite interesting that, um, you know, the non-personal data report actually uh, states that while the data protection authority's objective is protection of data, the non-personal data authority is actually to make more data available for innovation and economic and social benefits. And um, just thinking about it while reading the report, I was like, these two regulators are constantly going to be fighting with each other. Um, and you know, we can see that kind of tension grow over the years. But Reagan, I want to circle back to you as someone who is you know, working out of a jurisdiction where these conversations are probably a bit more, um, have been going on for longer. Um, do you see this non this distinction between personal and non-personal data uh, as something that is sustainable? Um, we understand the objectives and we probably, like Sean mentioned, we, we empathize with the idea of where this is coming from. But if you are to try to control data, is creating a non-personal and personal data by really the most uh, sustainable way forward, A. And B, um, where I'm getting into a bit of uh, speculation here, but is also non-personal data, has it become the object of regulation because the GDPR is in place and it sets and defines rights and boundaries around personal data? So now the only way to access data is to create this alternative framework, which looks at like, you know, the kind of distinction that the non-personal data framework in India is looking at, that the data protection authority will take care of protection and we will focus on innovation and economic prosperity. Thanks, Jody. I will try to answer uh, both of these questions. These are really good questions. And I think they're really at the core um, uh, of some of the challenges basically that, that, that we're looking at um, in the discussion of the Data Governance Act and future data governance regulations. I think there's actually maybe two sort of binaries. One is the technical one of is anonymization possible or feasible or sustainable? Um, and then another one around that already came up to Annabelle's and Sean's points around um, does the same level of pre protection apply to personal data as it does to, to non-personal data? Um, so first on, on the first one, I mean, on the an anonymization or that binary question, um, generally like anonymization is a very good and encouraged privacy enhancing technique. Um, the, 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 the issue that arises is, and what many security ex experts continue to say is that it may not even, it may not be possible to achieve anonymization. And I think as we um, continue to live in a, in a you know, data filled world where you can co constantly add and combine data sets, even public pieces of data sets can lead to identification of individuals or groups of people, which is just about as good as identifying an individual. Um, it becomes a, a very uh, difficult topic. So in, in the case of regulation, this is almost impossible. And I've seen some uh, confusion, I think, around the use of this term. If it is anonymized, um, that means that it cannot be re-identified, period, not possible. I know the NPD, we have left in our, our, our public comments and we will file in our following uh, public comments that um, this in particular uh, cannot be, you know, that binary just does not exist. So, um, so that's something that needs to be taken uh, really into account. The GDPR, the way they handle this is they, they, there is no anonymization in the GDPR. It's called pseudonymization. So there is an open acknowledgement that it might not be technically possible. And you use pseudonymization as a privacy enhancing technique for companies, for instance, to split the data sets and to protect them in different ways, which makes it harder. Or so when you have like a data breach, you're not, you know, um, creating a, a whole bunch of risks. So 
Again, it's not perfect, but in the context of risk mitigation, uh, this could be possible. There's also other theories around thinking about the context and the use of data and according the kind of risk um, to that, uh, in addition to the re-identification um, aspects. So, um, so that's on the uh, that binary. On the other binary, I just think um, it's also just a really good point to uh, remember about the, the non-personal data. There is at least from what I, from what I've seen in the in the in the political discourse around this, there is this sort of understanding or hope, I guess, from the regulators that if it's non-personal data, it's a whole different thing. Um, and you know, we're talking about data flows, we're talking about industrial data. None of this applies. This isn't. This doesn't count for the GDPR. Um, and uh, it is, I think, a blurry line. Uh, but it definitely, again, to the to the previous point about the, the age of, of data where everything can be sort of combined and identified, that must be taken to account into the equation. Um, and while in the EU, you know, data protection and privacy are fundamental rights and, you know, non-personal data kind of sits in a different place, there should be an according sense of, you know, duty of loyalty, duty of care that should apply to ensure that this overall risk is accounted for. Otherwise, we're facing something, we're creating a lot of risks and in the EU context, um, undermining uh, personal data protection, which would be, I think, counter to some of the main objectives. Thank you. That is a really useful um, perspective to have on this. And I hope um, that the committee members at least, you know, are watching this or we somehow, I, I believe you will be submitting uh, comments and I hope this yeah. is reiterated again. Sean, um, this idea of ownership, you know, and this idea of data as an economic resource. We have other framings as well. And I want to ask you this question because CIGI has done this paper capturing the various analogies and metaphors that are used around data. We, I was uh, attending a session where the committee member uh, Parminder Jeet Singh was also uh, presenting today. And he talked about, you know, um, the rights framework, the data as labor and how that could possibly be um, also useful for informing the committee's work on data governance. Um, I kind of, so are there various models to how you actually think about data trusts? Um, is the Indian model really different from the EU model? Um, is this, like you said, is it data centric? Is it a data collector centric model that is in the EU? Um, if there is to be a data commons, then what are some of the principles? Is a data commons even possible with respect to data? And if we are to move in that direction, um, then you know what are some of the principles we need to think through that you have that you're aware of. Uh, I just want to thank. Uh, those are great questions, but also reflect that that both Annabelle's comments and Reagan's comments. I, I just agree so much. Um, one of the things that I wrote for CG uh, in they wrote a they did a series on platform governance and, and my contribution to that was, was about fiduciary supply chains. And so it's this idea of how do we trace loyalty through contracts, right? Like if I've signed 12 terms of service down through APIs, like how did I, where, who at the top of the food chain or the bottom of the food chain, depending on how you think of it, you know, is the holder of that fiduciary and how does the duty and how does it travel through those digital relationships? So just to offer that, you know, it's, 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 it's so wonderful to see so much of the conversation kind of moving, um, starting starting to interrogate how, how that is and is not real. Um, I think the data trust model, you know, um, trust, or, sorry, <laughs> fiduciary duties, generally speaking, are kind of like directions. They work when they're really specific and the less specific they become, the sort of more frustrating and prone to conflict they become. And so a lot of what we see when we see broadly defined duties or duties that are sort of, you know, now trustees hold these duties, but do they have more access to courts? Is there a separate court that is going to adjudicate, you know, the disputes between trustees? Are we just outsourcing essentially the kind of political and social risk to this 
future professional class of people who are going to, you know, get stuck in the same access to justice issues as every other, you know, kind of rights protection provision. I know that's not exactly the question you're asking, but what I'm saying is that there's in, in law, right, we have procedural justice, and then we also have sort of substantive or normative justice. And what that means is that like, the system has to work to a certain standard in order for us to believe that any justice is happening at all. And I think that what we see right now is that that things like the NPD, you know, do a and the Data Governance Act and any number of other pieces of legislation really focus on, you know, building a market for exchange, but don't focus on any of the institutional investments necessary to adjudicate the very predictable disputes and sort of legal gray areas and questions that are going to come out of figuring out what these things mean in context. And so what happens when you have big procedural mismatch issues is that you know you can kind of have whatever theory of rights that you want but it's it's the theory of rights that is most effectively adjudicated that tends to win the day and so if you think about you know you're, we're talking about ownership ownership is probably the best institutionally supported theory of rights in the world because money moves through it and everybody likes to move money and so we we make sure those those systems work but it's weird with data, right? Like if I hand you, a, if I sell you a data set, if I sell you, yeah, if I sell you a data set, the presumption is not that you collect spreadsheets, right? There's no like list of all the spreadsheets then you just gotta have them all, right? Like you are presumably ingesting things that you take as a representation of fact. I mean, you may put a confidence interval on it. You may, you know, add caveats, but when I give you data, I'm not, selling you a, a, an item, I'm telling you a thing, right? And the way that law treats how we tell each other things versus how we sell each other goods is, is big. And so, you know, so to your point, uh, the reason that I keep focusing on fiduciary law and, and, and procedural justice and things like this is that India specifically, but many, many countries in the world have huge civil law backlogs. The, the, the mechanisms of institutional justice just are overwhelmed and understandably uh, because we keep piling more and more things on them. But it, we need, you know, something like an NPD needs a reinvestment in the, uh, you know, the legal sector, the adjudicating authorities, the clarity to Annabelle's points about, you know, not only guidance at the beginning, but this is how you go and settle problems if the guidance isn't working for you, right? And so you have to have the sort of whole life cycle. And I think what we're doing is we're saying, let's make it a market issue. And we'll let's, let's focus on the economic value because we recognize that because it's really legible to us. But then let's sort of kick the can on how it is that we're going to deal with the fallout from this. And that's not working particularly well. I say that from Washington, DC. Um, so <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, you know, where you know, there, there are there are real, real consequences to not taking the governance aspects of this seriously. And, and I'm certainly in a place that's that's feeling them quite quite recently. So, you know, I, it's it, there there are different theories of rights, but no matter what the theory of rights is, in order for it to sort of work, you have to be able to adjudicate it. And if fiduciaries become an important part of the procedural justice infrastructure, I think that there's a real opportunity to do important important work here. But it's, it's, it's that piece that feels really unclear to me. So can we trust the trustees is my takeaway from that. Um, Annabelle, actually, um, this whole notion of that, you know, at least big tech, you know, these sort of regulations are aimed at kind of tackling the competition issues or the market challenges that arises from data firms becoming monopolies. But it's also mm -hmm. likely that these big firms are the ones that will be able to, you know, put in infrastructure or structures that are needed to cope with these various regimes, particularly for startups, you know. Um, how is this going to play out for them in terms of innovation and competition? Is, is taking this sort of an approach actually good for innovation in the long term? What, are, what, what is your view of this from coming from the perspective of you know, trade secrets or intellectual property? And I know that the second version of the report has gone into some level of clarification into you know, what kind of data is not under NPD. But again, going back to what Sean also said that you know, it's not just data that you're collecting. Um, a company is 
collecting data in a certain context, that value is derived from that data set in a particular context. And even if you were to take that data set and make it available, it's not necessary that you've been able to tackle the fact that this big company is deriving a certain kind of value from it. So, you know, um, just your thoughts that is this, is, does this thinking in the report and the committee's thinking on this issue, does it need more reflection uh, or is it suitably advanced in terms of providing that kind of regulatory clarity that the committee is actually aiming to go for? Um, so you've, an, you've asked quite a number of very interesting questions. I'm going to try and pick up on a few and um, if I leave anything out, please, please, please also let me know. Um, I think the first thing that I, I want to say before we jump into anything is um, it will 100% affect innovation, right? It will 100% affect startup innovation. And the reason is not because, um, and you know, I think to Sean's point, like it's, it's a great idea to go and figure out how to do data trustees right and to have good data sharing frameworks in place and good data governance frameworks in place. All of those things are great. And a lot of governments around the world have been also trying to think about, you know, are there things that they can be doing to help build the trust um, as, you know, companies are trying to share data with each other voluntarily. You know, and, and are there any missing parts in the legal system, for example, that may not address certain rights if, you know, say you had a contract with somebody else and then you agree that you only use data in a certain way and then it's used some, some way else. How do you pass through liability? How do you pass through, you know, that fiduciary duty, so on and so forth. So I think thinking about that framework is great. And Kennedy, thinking about that framework specifically, you know, could probably um, encourage innovation and, and data innovation. The issue with NPD is not that it's raised a whole bunch of great questions around data governance. The issue of MPD that's really harming innovation is that it's mandating the sharing of data um, in a very vague way with you know, a very vague notion of somebody, you know, could be boogeyman, could be called a trustee. We, we don't know who this is, right? Um, we don't even have a sense if he knows how to, you know, um, or she, <laughs> you know, or it, knows how to um, manage and govern data and protect that data, right? Um, that's what is causing um, you know, uncertainty in the market. That's what's making VCs go, well, hang on, if I invest in this company that's an Indian company and they go big and you know, they've, they're doing lots of cool innovative things and the government turns up tomorrow and says, I want your data, I'm gonna take it and I, I may or may not protect it properly. You know, and I may or may not, I may, I may choose to use it for whatever means. Um, I may use it in a way that it was never intended to be used and comes up with really terrible um, an analysis, but I rely on that because I somehow think that's good data and then pass the buck over back to you if something goes wrong, you know, and say, well, it's, it's clear your fault that, you know, my policy analysis failed because I did evidence making policy and I rely on your data and your data told me X, but it turned out to be Y. So, I mean, there are so many problematic issues around data sharing, around data governance, around data trustees that need to be addressed first before you talk about mandating. And I think that's something that, you know, if, if, we, if we think about the NPD conversation as it's evolved over the last two years, really, um, I think, you know, it, it raises a really great um, point, you know, honestly, which says, hey, I don't think, you know, India knows how to do data governance yet. Actually, for that matter, I don't think the world really knows how to do data governance yet. I don't think the world knows about how to ensure that, you know, you've got that fiduciary duty being, being um, passed on and the liability. How do you judge that if someone, you know, takes data that, you know, was bad data and made some really bad life altering decisions for someone on that basis? Whose responsibility should that be? You know, so I think there are some really important questions and we see some of those questions being mirrored, say, in the AI governance, ethics and governance world. That's a really robust and deep conversation happening there. But we don't really see one happening as, as much in the data sharing world. And maybe it's because the word AI is more sexy than data sharing. I, I don't know. But you know, I think I think I think at some point that conversation needs to be had. So I would say that um, no, I don't think the COE's report goes anywhere close to needing to address that. I think it's a great starting point, um, but then really maybe the, the, the focus for India, if they wanted to build that innovation, if, they, if the government was starting to think about making some of their data sets publicly available, making it open data, or even just sharing it amongst themselves, maybe that question is the one they should be answering first. How do we do data governance and data trusteeship well? Um, 
So that's that's really down to it. Um, I think it was another kind of very interesting angle. I, I know we keep on talking about personal and non-personal data regulation. Can I can I just say this? It's been on my mind for a while, so I just want to get it off my chest. I think the problem is that um, the, lo- the, the regulatory framework that we're calling non-personal data should not be called non-personal data. Non-personal data is the ideal ideal scope, I guess, or the proposed scope of the framework, but it's not actually what the framework is trying to do. The framework is actually trying to enable data sharing, right? And maybe that's what you call it, right? In some cases, um, if, you know, mandate data sharing, and we have to really debate whether that mandating portion is necessary at this stage, and my answer will be no, but, you know, um, let's call it data sharing framework. If we call it data sharing framework or data governance framework or data accountability framework, that will make a lot more sense. And then we'll stop fighting about whether or not personal data and non-personal data are the same or different things. They're completely different regulatory frameworks, right? I mean, personal data protection is about privacy. You know, it's about the individual. And non-personal data framework is about how do you share data better that incidentally happens to be data that doesn't identify an individual. At least that's the focus of the the framework um, as it's laid out today. So I think that's another thing to just call out and and say very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I answered all your questions. <laughs> if there's anything I missed out, please let me know. But um, hopefully that's. I have, I've been thinking about these questions as I speak. So I mean, I probably don't remember, but that is a fantastic point on probably actually defining this or naming, you know, the intention, calling it out that, you know, it should not be non-personal data. Uh, Reagan, did you want to respond to something that Annabel uh, said? I did, I actually, I just, I, I think that her points resonate, especially on like the innovation piece and thinking as Benzilla is a, a, a medium sized player and also smaller player on, um, on the data governance stuff. But before that, also, I, I think that's quite an eloquent idea actually to stop calling it non-personal data. And then that would solve a lot of problems because it already embeds the risk into the into the name because it's just data, right? And if we know that inside of it, there will be personal data and non-personal data and just acknowledging that it's a mix. Anyway, I so I like that idea. Um, but just on the um, innovation piece, just from our experience of um, you know, working with smaller companies, uh, thinking about the GDPR, compli- like complying with the GDPR, the UK government, there were a couple of examples that, that you know, they're thinking about um, their data governance regime. So I guess there's just two points to highlight if there are, um, if the Indian government is, is watching. Um, one, for in terms of like mandating sharing, I think we've also been public about this. We, we, we also don't think that that's the right way. I think there needs to be value in the sharing. And in order to find that value, there has to be um, genuine and meaningful consultation with small and medium-sized companies. Um, I can say in the EU, that is often very difficult and doesn't always happen. So because the big tech companies are always there and they're more, they're better resourced. And then you have um, sort of, associations or organizations that are seem to be representing small companies but are but are not really actually representing them so i would just tr- say for any government looking at these types of regulations to really try to find those companies and to help like to get from them what they think would be valuable in order for them to actually derive the value from these types of regulations. And then that leads to the second point, which is another problem that we've seen um, with small companies is this misunderstanding of the regulations themselves and how to use them. So they don't have armies of lawyers. Um, a lot of these smaller companies, right? They'll have one or two or maybe five, uh, but they don't have uh, you know, a lot of, of that. So what happens, what we've seen is a lot of misunderstanding and very conservative readings of these legislations. So that's where you actually get the innovation chill. It's not in the law itself, but it's in the, the way that the small companies and the startups perceive it and think that it is. So there needs to be a better connection between those who are crafting the laws and those who they want to actually benefit um, and think less about the sort of bigger companies who often are crafting it for their own um, their own value. Sean, do you have- Yeah, sorry, I'm super uh, in a, unable to control the mute button on my trackpad apparently, but uh, two, two really wonderful comments. I actually run a small business called Frontline SMS, which started as a last mile technology company. And so we, and I had the unfortunate uh, problem of being trained as a lawyer. So I was 
uh, for the last 10 years have been this kind of small company with the legal nerds. We don't have the resources to address the issues, but we definitely see all of them. And so I remember sleep. But the the thing that I you know wanted to speak speak back to actually was this um, was the seizure of power and and or sorry the seizure of data the mandate of of sharing of data whichever term we're, we're using for this that um, historically speaking there is an enormous legal precedent for governments essentially compelling the disclosure of things under you know in in uh, from private entities whether it's individuals or groups or companies but it is under as reagan said specific circumstances it is and it is also an extension of what we think of as the sort of emergency wing of government powers and so you know you have full blown emergency powers at which point you know they're typically overseen but you have you know by an independent or you know, a, a checked authority like a legislature or, or a legal authority. Um, but, you know, governments are able to do seize entire tracts of land, you know, can can lay waste to all kinds of rights in, in, in pursuit of a good enough public good, right? But we recognize that most goods aren't that important and we don't want to like completely let every government completely off the hook of accountability and checks on behavior. So we have reduced versions of that, right? We have things like subpoena authority and we have, you know, wiretapping authority and we have public disclosure and we have taxes, right? These are all ways in which private entities contribute back, but they are all specific and they're all specific and sort of described under a set of circumstances or relationships and they're uniquely requested. And so I think one of the things that we're seeing in the move to sort of fiduciaries is that while there is a sort of a, a real positive advance in building infrastructure, you know, from bottom up accountability essentially or for the first rung in the supply chain to an extent, you've got to be really careful with creating functionally emergency powers that operate under umbrellas that are as administratively and definitionally abstract as the public good. And so, I mean, to agree with, with, with both Annabella and Reagan and just say that there is a framework. And one of the things that's happening in this conversation and in this, in this report and in, in the adoption of data trusts, globally speaking, is this moving of the eight ball of emergency powers from restricted, relatively checked, finite use in digital use and in, in data to be this more ambiguously administered public good, public initiative. And that's not to say there aren't public goods, but it's to say that the specificity of the conversation matters dramatically to Reagan's point about whether they're realized and whether they're risky. True. Um, we're already over our um, allotted time, but since I'm a greedy person and I don't know when I'll have an opportunity opportunity to have these kind of informed uh, questions. Can we, can we quickly weigh in on this whole idea of data sovereignty? Um, and I guess it touches on what Sean mentioned and what Reagan talked about and what Annabelle, you've been talking about in terms of fragmentation, but this whole idea that, and today, um, again, in the session that Parminder was, he said that the community rights framework is probably an improvement on the idea of the of eminent domain where the state can just come and say that you know we have all data of india belongs to india i mean citizens of all data of indian citizens belongs to india but frankly the report actually starts out with that acknowledgement so um is it really an improvement and you know can we does the data sovereignty approach actually benefit um global internet and you know the way things have been working so far clearly not but you know where are we headed with this kind of fragmentation and the second is the question of uh, data infrastructures which you know I'm, and you can choose which you respond to because you know we won't have time for all but this whole idea that a lot of governments have been investing in creating digital champions um, and you know how do you then negotiate how these digital champions are going to use laws to you know um, collectivize so, you know, Indian data infrastructure versus global data infrastructure, is that the World War Three situation that we see playing out in the digital domain? Anyone can go for it. It's not just some, anyone specific. I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick thing and then hopefully let other people say smarter things, but jump on the, that's a big question grenade. Um, 
I, sovereignty is one of those things that people talk about legally, I think, and really rarely understand, right? So like you can't declare sovereignty in the same way that you can't like declare, ba declare bankruptcy. You know, you can't just like walk around, like there's a joke in the United States about people being like, bankruptcy, and, like that's not what does it. There's a whole process, you have to file paperwork, right? And so in, in, digital trans in the digital transformation of the relationship between a person and states, right, we're seeing a lot of political philosophy play out, a lot of service design you know, philosophy play out. And I think what we're really seeing is that, uh, I wrote a piece in Foreign Policy a while ago that analogized this very sloppily with, with someone who knows much more about the sort of pre-China era in, in the sense that it was in a lot of ways the definition of the modern state because you had different factions that had to balance kind of their interdependence and their economics and their social well-being. Very, very broad sweeping analogy. But the, the point being is that we're in this place where different states are sort of choosing different approaches at different levels. And some are calling it sovereignty, some are calling it localization, some are calling it adherence to international norms. Others are combating that with globalization norms. And so there's a, at some level, it's very hard to do this unilaterally. And I think that what I, the other part of this that I, I really wonder about or, or I'm curious about is that we talk, you know, this is essentially getting done unilaterally and then with harmonization through trade agreements or participation in international fora. But it's like, it's just this first past the post and then people sign on based on where their other contextual allegiances lie. And so I think with sovereignty, you know, the term doesn't mean what most people think it means when they say it. And, you know, to, to Annabelle's point about let's just call it what it is, like we're defining what the appropriate powers are in the digital relationship between a person and a state. That's great. We should be having those conversations, but calling it something else or like standing it on some abs, you know, some abstract thing that people can't really touch, I think separates and disempowers most people from conversations that are, are very visceral and, and impactful to their rights. So sovereignty, not really a thing, but if we all agree, then maybe, <laughs> like most things, I guess. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna jump in now um, only because um, I'm actually pretty bad at really big abstract concepts. I always like to bring that down to, you know, what me, the little man can, can understand. Um, and so to me, I think ultimately in order for the digital economy to work and all the relationships so between an individual and government, between governments and governments, between governments and corporations, big and small, um, and then between individuals and corporations, um, what you really need to have is really good balance. Um, so, so two things, first of all, you need to have a good concept and understanding around control and access to data. So control and access to data ultimately is at what everybody is fighting about and what everybody is fighting for. Um, that needs to be balanced against, um, you know, what I will broadly call rights. It's not the best way to term it, but let's just say, let's just use that word. Um, uh, and that, that goes to individual rights. So, you know, what should the right of the individual be? That goes to potentially community rights as well. And so when we look at the term community data being used um, outside of India, when we look across the rest of the world and where, where we see the term community data used, it's actually used um, mostly in, um, in the context of like first peoples and indigenous peoples and, and their community rights to data. So that's a very interesting conception. And, and that's because they are conferred a set of rights as a community in relation to you know, everything, including data, right? And then we go beyond that and we think about what should, and I, I, I think this is where it gets really complicated, maybe not the rights is not the right word, a lawyer in the room might be better able to, to find a word for me, but what is the government's, um, what kind of control should the government power, uh, have? What kind of powers should the government reserve um, as they're trying to, on the one hand, you know, balance the rights of the individuals, um, you know, against the companies, and also at the same time, try and figure out how they can potentially do certain things better, you know, um, including pol policy making, for example, um, and balance that against, you know, companies. And I think traditionally, as I think Sean mentioned, there, you know, there is precedent for when data can be um, mandatorily obtained. Um, those things are well defined for a reason. And um, I think that it should continue to be well defined for a reason. So it's just maybe a matter of sitting down and defining what are those circumstances in which the governments feel that they ought to have, you know, rights, um, you know, to certain kinds of data for certain kinds of purposes, right? And today, a lot of it in the regulatory world is focused on investigation and having the power of information so that you can find out, you know, if 
that regulated entities um, doing something that sh they shouldn't be doing. And so I think likewise, if we then think about that in the data world, um, what is that you know, similar right? And how do you define it in a way that's reasonable and that everybody can agree on? Um, the reality is it's already fragmented. So I think you know, we'll set that one aside. I think um, I, I feel like the, you know, when GDPR was um, passed, uh, I think there was a broad acknowledgement in the data privacy world that everything was either GDPR-like or not like GDPR, right? um, and that, that that sounds binary, but obviously it's, it's really not in practice. But um, but fragmentation is is just the way it works. So I think the most important thing then is ensuring that um, you know data can be used for its intended purpose. And I know the tendency is to want to put physical and geographical borders around that. I can understand why, because you need to tie legislation and laws and, and control over that. But at the end of the day, um, if all those regulations and laws means that data can't function for its purpose, then there's no point collecting data. And then data is pointless, right? But of course, again, you know, that has to be balanced with all the rights that we talked about. So control and access, I think um, thinking about those relationships and what control and access should look like in each of those relationships in every jurisdiction really has to be the responsibility of every government um, trying to operate in the digital world. True, all fantastic points. In fact, I've been grappling with how uh, making more data available is actually in conflict with data protection principles of purpose limitation and you know consent based um, use so uh, you know and i'm not a lawyer so i thought you know this is just me not being able to understand what's written in the report but i'm glad that you know um, somebody like you who's been working on these issues is also equally confused uh, reagan any Thoughts on my two very big questions. I have very big questions. I'll I'll be really brief because I think um, Annabelle and, and Sean covered a lot of it. But um, it's not just you, uh, because we you know I have these same questions. And I think I would just say that I I think the the concept of data sovereignty is problematic and generally of data ownership. And one of the things. Um, as you mentioned, like what is core within data protection frameworks and what is the purpose of having data protection frameworks is to account for and mitigate against the risks of, of asymmetries of power. And that is built everywhere and on every level of society. If it's, you know, patient and doctor, or if it's broader, you know, in our broader society with class differences, you know, buying a home, there's just a range of when you're sharing data or handing over data, there is always an imbalance of power. And the data protection framework is supposed to protect against that. And that's what purpose limitation is for. That's what all of those core data protection principles are about. Data sovereignty invokes, um, I think the ideas are, you know, in the EU, there was a lot, especially post Snowden revelations, a lot of like technological sovereignty, you know? So I think it, it does provoke some a good intentions in terms of let's be independent, let's build our own, own, own technology, let's be in control of our, of our, you know, technological destiny. I understand that, but but that is inherently very problematic, and so is the the ownership piece. I think what we want to get to is a, a collective management. So an understanding that um, individuals have uh, data that is related to them that needs to be protected, and there are you know legal frameworks around that. Hopefully soon, India will have one as well. Um, and then on top of that, how do we think about how to collectively manage that together? And so it's not necessarily about ownership or sovereignty, but about collective management. Okay, any parting thoughts, um, any big issue regarding this big problem that we have not touched upon, small issues? One, one little thing, there's a, a really great quote from like an early stage venture capitalist, which is never a sentence I expected to say, which is that uh, when you fail to consider the problems of a system pre-deployment, the system is most often characterized by its failures as opposed to whatever value you'd intended for it. And I think that, you know, to Reagan's point, and I mean, to, to Annabelle's points as well, it's, it's that piece of this type of legislation. It's considering the problems ahead of time and planning for them in a proactive way. And to your point about digital champions, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of countries develop digital champions and kind of banked on the idea that they would either be political independent or very nationalist. 
and not really built any mechanism to say which or why or how or provide any barrier or protection to that. And what a lot of the fragmentation that we're talking about to an extent is, you know, waking up with some real politique about how, how that works in practice. And so I think, you know, we can do these things if we build the mechanisms to do these things. But if we just hope it happens and then don't consider what could go wrong and build real preventions or real mechanisms to deal with that, as, as is sometimes the case in these frameworks, um, I think that's where you see them go off the rails quite commonly. 